to jump down now. <laughs> Standing on Treaty 6 territory, we recognize and acknowledge that this land on which we stand has been the gathering place for millennia of many Indigenous peoples. As Treaty people, we acknowledge, honour and respect the history, wisdom, knowledge, languages, ceremonies and culture of the First Nations of this continent, of the Métis peoples, of the Inuit, and of all who gathered in this place in Miskwichi. We learn from the First Peoples of our connection to the land, of our responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth, especially on Earth Day. We honour and respect and mourn the ancestors and children buried here, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and men. We acknowledge our need for collective healing. We remember that we are all treaty people and that we are all responsible for each other. And welcome to all. And it's been a busy April. Two Easter's, uh, Passover, and uh, the end of Ramadan and Eid. And it's also, it's Earth Day yesterday, and it's Shakespeare's birthday today. So, <laughs> Westwood is a welcoming space where we strive to embrace who and what we are, regardless of belief or how ourselves we currently conceive. Westwood is a challenging place where we individually and collectively trace a path that struggles to find truth. Westwood welcomes our elders, middles, muddles, and youths, and a rainbow of peoples and beliefs. Theists, non-theists, atheists, paganists, agnostics, gnostics, cynics, and eccentrics, Westwood welcomes people regardless of race, color, class, creed, or breed, gender, ethnicity, unicity, or elasticity. Westwood welcomes how you conceive your growing identity on the continuum of discovery. Whichever pronouns you choose to use today or tomorrow, or the direction of your affections, or your color in the rainbow. And Okay, we're going to read a passage from Muhammad Iqbal. Where in our hearts is that burning of desire? It is true that we are made of dust, and the world is also made of dust, but the dust has motes rising. Whence comes that drive in us? We look to the starry sky and love storms in our hearts. Whence comes that storm? The journey of love is a very long journey. But sometimes with a sigh, you can cross that vast desert. Search and search again without losing hope. You may find sometime a treasure on your way. My heart and my eyes are all devoted to the vision. And I'd like to welcome Sarah Gruel from McEwen, and she's going to be giving us some reflections on Ramadan and I presume Eid, which is Thursday evening, I believe. Yes. Yes. Okay with the sundown and sorry I'm just uh, ah please stand or yes come come wherever you are whoever you are I believe that's what I was told <laughs> Now, this first hymn is actually around, so uh, we know it really well. So we're going to sing it once all together. And then could we start with this side and then this side? And this side, you're going to repeat, come yet again, come twice. We'll all sing that together at the end. I'll point to you when it's your turn. <laughs> Here we go. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of living, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yes, again, come. Come, come, whoever you are. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Candles of joy and concern are an important part of every Unitarian Universalist congregation. And so I welcome anybody who wishes to uh, light a candle of joy or concern. And um, And I'll light one more candle for all of those uh, uh, joys and concerns that uh, remain unspoken. And please join us in the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth, love and affection, and trusting God. Yes, we're going to sing hymn number 193. And please um, join us standing in body or spirit. I just realized I never introduced myself for those of you who don't know me. I'm Rob Wisnera, and I um, have known Sara from, uh, she was just finished her PhD and we hired her as an advisor at Grant McEwen because that's the only job she could get at the time. <laughs> and then we, then she flipped that into a continuing faculty position and has been a star. At, at McEwen, an excellent, uh, excellent instructor, and an excellent scholar, and, and an excellent colleague. And uh, um, one, one time, I, I, uh, she mentioned uh, fasting, and I didn't, I didn't realize that she was Muslim at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but, uh, but I remembered that, and I thought, oh, it would be really nice to have somebody talk to us about. Ramadan, and so I invited Sara, and uh, and I, I assume she's also going to talk a little bit about Eid as well because that just passed. But uh, with no further ado, welcome Sara. Yes. Okay. Great. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi min wala arma bad. I began in the name of God. I send his praises and I send peace and blessings on to the Prophet Muhammad and his family and his companions. 
I was at an event recently that um, mentioned that a treaty acknowledgement is a little bit like a prayer. And I noticed that uh, as Rob was giving his treaty acknowledgement, um, many of you bowed your heads in, in reverence for that. So I wanted to give um, my own very short version of that um, by offering the following. I acknowledge that we're gathered here today on Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional home of many indigenous groups, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. May God give justice and peace to those peoples on whose land we are uninvited guests, and may he make us from among those who bring about that justice in this world. I mean. The title of my talk today is Confessions of a Fasting Muslim, um, or Things I Wish Every Non-Muslim Knew About Ramadan. Um, and so with that, I'll just jump right in. If you can go to the next slide. So the first half of the talk is just the basic cultural literacy things. Um, it's not anything groundbreaking in the sense that it's everything you'll find on a Wikipedia page, but hopefully I will give a little bit more um, spice to it um, to, to add a little bit more of a personal touch to that. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, which is based on the moon. Um, so it begins with the sighting of the new moon um, and ends with the next sighting of the new moon. So um, in my culture, my family is from Pakistan and India, and a big part of our celebrations are on the night when it's expected that Eid will be there. Um, there's a big fair and everyone goes outside and, and looks for, for the moon. And there's a henna, as you can see, I've got henna on my hands and food and, and just um, excitement. It goes on till late in the night. Um, because Ramadan is based on the uh, lunar calendar, it goes back 10 to 11 days every year according to the Gregorian calendar. So uh, this year it started um, in March and then it'll, it'll slowly go back and eventually it'll be in December when it'll be really easy. <laughs> um, Ramadan is special. Oh, uh, you can keep going. Just keep clicking through if you, if you would. Uh, one more time. Here we go. Um, so Ramadan is the month in which the Quran, which is our holy book, was revealed to the prophet Muhammad, who's um, our last prophet that we believe in. Um, so for this reason, Ramadan is known as the month of the Quran. Um, it is, of course, also the month of fasting, but for many Muslims, it's, it's actually first and foremost the month of the Quran. Um, and Ramadan is also understood as the month of mercy. It's also referred to as the month of mercy, um, where Allah's forgiveness is at its peak. And I'm going to say Allah because that's how I conceive of God, but however you conceive of the divine can like that in there. Um, we also believe that the shayateen or the, the devils, so to speak, are locked up in Ramadan. So Allah um, puts them in, um, yeah, puts them in hell basically and doesn't let them come out. And so there's a sense that in Ramadan, it's easier to do good. Um, than it is at other times. And I've really felt that this year uh, in Ramadan, it was so easy to make my five daily prayers and read a ton of Quran and do all of the things. And literally on Eid, it's like, what time is prayer again? <laughs> What's happening? Um, so it is actually amazing how Ramadan just makes things easier to, that your, your sense of God is, is heightened. Uh, next. Um, so fasting is one of the five, uh, you can click again, please. Fasting is one of the five pillars of Islam. Um, the others are, um, if you'll click again, Hannah, thank you. Um, the others are belief in Allah, which is the first pillar, um, or the shahada, the five daily prayers, or salah, uh, the yearly charity, or zakat, and uh, pilgrimage to Mecca or Hajj, which is um, once in a lifetime requirement for those who have the means. Um, one of the things I love about the five pillars of Islam is that um, you'll notice there's a difference in the time periods. So belief in Allah should be reaffirmed in every moment with every breath. Um, the five daily prayers are five times every day. Um, the, the fasting is one month out of a year. The zakat is once every year and then the pilgrimage is once every uh, uh, in a lifetime. So your, your faith is reaffirmed in these different cycles. Um, Muslims fast from sunrise. It's actually before sunrise. A lot, a lot of times people say sunrise, but it's actually about an hour and a half before sunrise. So the official, the way it's described in the Quran is that it's the time when um, if you're outside, you can, uh, once you can begin to distinguish between a black thread and a white thread, um, you that means that the, the fasting has begun and it's time for the pre-dawn prayer. Um, and that, that prayer actually ends with the sunrise time. Um, so it's a little bit before sunrise actually that we begin fasting. Uh, the meal that we eat in the morning prior to the beginning of the fast is called suhoor. Um, and then we break our fast with a meal called iftar, um, at, and that one's at sunset. 
Traditionally, Muslims break their fast with dates um, or, and or with water following the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, and not everyone has to fast, so valid exemptions for fasting include pregnancy, menstruation, travel, um, and illness, whether temporary or chronic, and also childhood, so children do not have to fast or not required to fast until um, they reach the age of puberty, um, although sometimes you know, many children will choose to fast, but again, it's not a requirement. Um, going to the next one. Um, so fasting in Ramadan, again, many people just think of it as the lack of food, but um, it actually includes no food, no drink, including water. I know it's a big one for non-Muslims. A lot of many Muslims, non-Muslims don't realize that we don't drink water either. Um, you also, there's no sexual intimacy or relations while, during the fast. Um, you also can't get angry, you can't lie, you can't gossip, you can't fight, and you can't swear. So it is a full fast. Uh, it's not just food. <laughs> Food's the easy part um, in a way, um, but it includes physical, mental, and emotional restraint. So um, if you do, for example, you know, accidentally lie or gossip during the fast, it's possible that, that the fast is invalidated in a way. Um, so this this meme, I added a bunch of memes. I, Ramadan memes are one of my favorite parts of the season. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, um, just the way that you kind of have to restrain your tongue as well during Ramadan. <laughs> um, okay, next. Uh, there's also um, something called Laylat al-Qadr, which is uh, translated as the night of power or the night of decree. Um, it takes place in one of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So uh, Ramadan's obviously 30 days or sometimes 29, depending on the moon. And the last 10 nights are considered to be the most holy. They're the most holy nights out of the entire year. Um, and in particular, the odd nights in those last 10, so 21, 23, 25, 27, 29, um, any one of those nights could be Laylatul Qadr or the night of decree in which um, the, the Quran says that this one night is better than a thousand months. So in other words, praying throughout the night on that night is equivalent to 83 years of praying. Um, and if you uh, click again, Hannah, um, on this night, all of the angels descend to earth to answer prayers and write your decree for the following year. Um, so what all the things that are going to happen in your life are written and in the following year are written on that night is, is what we believe. And so we stay up all night praying for what what we would like that decree to look like. Um, um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that on that night, there are more angels that come to earth than there are rocks on earth. So um, even just, I got chills just, just thinking of that image. Um, and when I stay up for to pray um, all night on that night, I really like to imagine, and sometimes it almost feels like I can see that my room is just illuminated with light, even though all the, all the lights are off because um, my kids are sleeping. But um, it's a really, it's a really beautiful um, tradition and belief of ours. Um, and then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu also said that um, whoever prays the night of Laylatul Qadr will have all of his past sins forgiven, and some people believe even future sins are, are forgiven on that night. So, um, yeah, going to the next slide. Um, and then Eid al-Fitr is the festival that marks the end of um, Ramadan. So um, the, the word for the meal that breaks your fast is iftar. And it comes from the same word. Uh, this word also comes from the same root in Arabic. Eid al-Fitr is the festival of breaking the fast, is what that means. Um, the sighting of the new moon, like I said, indicates that Ramadan has ended and that Eid al-Fitr has begun. Um, Eid is actually a three-day celebration, um, so we're on day three, so it is te technically still Eid, so that's why I've come in my Eid clothes. This is how I would typically dress to celebrate Eid. Um, and on Eid morning of the first day of Eid, uh, we have a communal prayer. Um, one of my favorite parts of that prayer actually is um, on your way to that prayer, the entire time you're supposed to be reciting a chant and your family recites together. And as you enter the mosque, everyone is reciting that same chant and you all join your voices together. And it goes like this. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walilahi alhamd. And so if you can just imagine like hundreds of people reciting and then chanting that together, um, it's, it gives me chills again, it's, it's a beautiful tradition. Um, so in addition to the prayer, uh, it's a tradition to wear new clothes, to do henna, um, to exchange gifts. Um, children in particular get money. 
um, and just meeting friends and, and hanging out. Um, another beautiful tradition is that as a requirement as part of selling, celebrating Eid is to pay a zakat al-fitr, um, which is a charity given to Muslims who can't afford to celebrate the Eid. So Muslims who are below the poverty line um, uh, receive this charity so that they have the means to celebrate Eid. So we don't leave people out on Eid. Um, okay, so one of the things um, I, I think it's important to talk about is the purpose of fasting. So you might have heard particular reasons for fasting. Um, things that people will say will be things like um, experiencing hunger helps us understand how, how it feels to be hungry. So people who don't have regular access to food or are food insecure, we can understand how it feels when we keep ourselves hungry. Or just to sort of remember how lucky we are to have food and drinks and to be grateful. Um, but those aren't actually <laughs> the real reasons. I feel like this is these are the things that many people say in a secular society to get around talking about the divine and, and what are the sort of religious or divine reasons for observing the fast. Um, so the real reasons or the primary reasons are first and foremost because Allah told us to. So if you believe in the Quran, it says in the Quran very straightforwardly, you're supposed to fast for Ramadan. And so you do it whether you understand the reason or not. And sometimes there's a wisdom in things that we can't um, we don't have access to. Um, and the reason that uh, Allah, that God tells us in the Quran though, is that fasting allows us to come closer to him. And um, we refer to that as taqwa in Arabic. Um, so going ahead, I'll say a little bit more about taqwa. Um, taqwa is most often translated as God consciousness. So it's an awareness of God that pervades all moments, behavior, and thoughts, um, and develops particularly from a close relationship with the Quran. Um, and so Ramadan is like a spiritual boot camp um, you can think of as an opportunity to reset or to increase your taqwa throughout the year. Um, so it's like all those bad habits you've developed throughout the year, Ramadan is your chance to kick them back to the curb and to start again. Um, so some of the practices that we engage in to increase taqwa would be obviously the fast, um, the prayers, but also additional prayers beyond just the required five, uh, learning and reciting the Quran, um, doing a liquor, which is just remembrance of God's names and repeating his names over and over, um, giving extra charity, that is, um, so many Muslims will give charity every single day in Ramadan and in large amounts, so the idea is that your left hand should not know what your right hand is giving, so you should just be giving freely um, throughout Ramadan. Um, there's Salat al-Tarawih, which is a special prayer in the mosque throughout Ramadan that takes place at night. Um, and then just making lots of du'a du'as like supplication or just, you know, offering whatever prayers in whatever language that you prefer for whatever you, you want to see, uh, offering gratefulness and thanks as well. Um, and so, yeah, all of those things are practices. So again, it's not just about the actual fasting, but um, all of these things are part of Ramadan. Um, so one thing to think about is sort of if you were to rearrange everything in your life, literally everything, your schedule, your routine, everything, um, so that your only priority is to please God, or you know, if you prefer to just be the best possible human being that you could be in every single action and thought, what would that look like for you? Um, what would you do? What would you not do? How would you spend your time? So a lot of what Muslims do is prior to Ramadan, we literally sit down and we write down these are the things I'm going to give up. These are my goals for this month. This is what I want to focus on. Um, and I think one thing that's hard to explain about Ramadan to non-Muslims is that I feel many of us are uncomfortable with this kind of account taking of ourselves. It's literally what it's called in Arabic, muhasaba, account taking. What am I doing wrong? Where am I messing up? You know, I don't think of myself as someone that lies very much, but if I'm con really consciously thinking, I want to tell the truth at all times, I notice the little white lies that I tell my kids. Oh, there's no onions in this boot. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I honestly, outside of Ramadan, I don't even notice that as a lie, right? So there's so many things that we um, take for granted that we we don't want to call ourselves to account for. There's all kinds of things that, that make that process uncomfortable and it is uncomfortable, but it's also that discomfort is the opportunity for growth that Ramadan gives us. So that account taking and that really conscientious, um, attempt to make ourselves the best possible human beings that we can be. That's what Ramadan is about. Um, okay, so now we've entered the confessions piece. <laughs> um, so these are just things that you sh don't have to know, but it's nice. Um, then the first one is that we really don't mind when people eat in front of us, I, honestly. Um, 
So we're used to fasting. Many Muslims have been fasting since childhood. I've been fasting. Um, I fasted all 30 days for the first time when I was nine years old. It's been a long time. It really doesn't bother me when people eat in front of me. It actually kind of bothers me more to feel left out. Like my friends will go for lunch and I'm like, okay, I'll just sit in my office by myself, <laughs> you know? So, um, so yeah, it really, it really doesn't bother us. Um, and also it's not like tempting to have food in front of us. Like we, again, it's, it's a spiritual training. So it's not like, oh man, I really wish I could take a sip of that coffee. It doesn't feel like that. Um, that being said, uh, if you really want to show love for your Muslim friends, um, include them in lunches or gatherings by giving them food to take home afterwards. So invite them out and then give them a doggy bag. Um, two of my best uh, like iftar moments from this year were exactly that. One was uh, my daughter was fasting uh, by her choice. She's not required to, she's nine. Um, and they had a party in school that day. And her teacher had very purposefully brought Ziploc bags and, and little take home things so she could have cupcakes. And he also included um, chips and cupcakes for all of us in the family to, for her to take home. So we had this lovely chip and cupcake party <laughs> um, for, for Aftar after, after sunset. And it was just so lovely to, to know that someone had been thinking of us in that way. Um, and similarly, my mother-in-law, my in-laws aren't, aren't Muslim. And so uh, my mother-in-law saw a particular type of um, Indian sweet that I love, and she, and she picked it up for me um, so that I could have it when I broke my fast. So those kinds of gestures are so, so thoughtful and, um, and they're really, really, really meaningful. Um, one thing that I actually, I forget about this, so as I'm reminding myself first here, um, it can be inadvertently offensive to ask if someone is fasting. So I try to do this, I'm like, oh, I'm fasting, I want to bond with my fellow Muslim person, so hey, how's the fast going? Don't say that, like I have to, <laughs> I have to rein myself in as well too, because there's many reasons why people may not be fasting and they may not want to share that with you, right? So it can be akin to asking, are you on your period, <laughs> right? Which is like awkward for some people to answer, right? Um, or do you have a chronic illness? right so there could be lots of reasons why someone's not fasting that they really may not want to share with you so it's better to just not ask if someone is fasting at all um, and instead you can just offer wishes for Ramadan just ask how Ramadan in general is going so those that don't fast will still partake in the, the spiritual aspects and, and the increased charity and the increased prayers and all of those things um, so just giving more asking a more general question than just about the fasting um, this one is, I've been reflecting on this point in particular this year. Um, so one of my good friends repeatedly says something to me like, when, um, oh, I really admire you for, for fasting. I could never do that. And I, I'm like, yes, you could, <laughs> right? Like, you really can do almost anything that you put your mind to. Um, and so in my mind, what that translates to is, I am so attached to this glass of water that I will not give it up, even if it means I could be a better person as a result of that. Um, or alternatively, um, I think the intention behind that statement is, oh, you're fasting and that seems really hard. Um, if you could just click Hannah. Um, but to me, that sounds like I don't want to have to sacrifice anything to become a better person, or I don't want to have to sacrifice anything to become closer to God. Um, and then the last point with that is that it feels a bit othering to me, like, oh, you can do that. That's so hard. It's actually not unusual, like over 2 billion people in the world do it. Um, so again, it's, it's just not um, the kindest way, I think, and again, inadvertently of, a, of a recognizing that, that Ramadan is going on. Um, so instead, I was thinking, what would I like to hear instead? So one could be just your devotion to your faith is so admirable, um, or may God accept your worship, or, or some version of that, or, or other ways of saying it. Also, my Catholic best friend fasted all of Ramadan with me for years. I want to say for eight years, he fasted with me just for funsies. <laughs> just to, <laughs> um, and so it's actually like you actually can do it. You'd be surprised if you really want to. Um, and the other thing this year, actually, my, my group of friends that are not Muslim um, participated in the non-food aspects of fasting with me. So we figured out that, you know, we were gossiping a little bit too much or we were complaining a little bit too much and that's not a good thing for any of us. And so we all partake of that. And I feel our, our group dynamic has actually become a lot more healthy as a result. So there's lots of elements to fasting beyond just the food. Um, so th think about that. Think if, if you wanted to take in, partake in that, taking account of where you could improve outside of the giving up of food and drink, what, what would that look like for you? And see if you could put that into practice for a day or 30 days. Um, 
The other point I think the non-Muslims don't realize is the lack of sleep is so much harder, so much harder than the lack of food. Um, and and uh, the corollary to that is the lack of coffee for me is harder than the lack of water. Um, so this is my schedule. This is just a sample schedule of what my day looks like in Ramadan. So I wake up at 4 a.m., I eat suhoor, I pray, I read Quran before the kids get up so I have some time to focus. Um, I go back to sleep at 5.30. Um, that's a quick nap, but it's a terrible nap because you chug water in the morning and you have to keep getting up to pee. So I get up like three times um, in, in those two hours just to just to pee. Uh, so it's not a good nap. And then around 7.15, I get the kids up, I get them to school, I'll stay up after that and I'll do some work. Um, around 1 p.m., I take a nap so again, so I'll get in about two hours there, pick up the kids from school at 3.15, do their homework, take them to their activities, maybe get in some more of my own work, um, feed them, bathe them, all of that stuff. Um, then at 8.30 is when we eat, we break our fast roughly is, is when it was uh, ending toward the end of the month here. Um, and then I put the kids to bed after that. Ideally, they would go to bed before I eat so I could eat in peace, but that didn't happen this year. Um, and then I'll nap with them when I put them to bed. And then I wake up um, at 10.45 um, for the evening or nighttime prayer. And then I read more Quran. I'll stay up <clears throat> further to continue praying again, particularly in the last 10 nights. The goal is to stay up all night. I wasn't able to do that. Again, my kids are relatively young. It's hard, um, but I stayed up as much as I could. Um, and then sleep when you absolutely can't stay awake up anymore. <laughs> and then you're up at 4 a.m. again. So as you can see, like I, I don't think for all of Ramadan, I don't think I slept more than two or three hours at a stretch um, for 30 days. So it's exhausting. <laughs> so again, if you really want to show love for your Muslim friend, you will give them a space to nap. <laughs> During Ramadan, that's what they really want. Um, okay, just two more points here. Um, so this one is, uh, is I, again, I think this took a little bit of deeper reflection for me to share this. It's, it is somewhat vulnerable. So uh, like Christmas, Ramadan is often depicted about being, is, is being about community. There is a communal aspect to it. You're supposed to break your fast in community. You're supposed to go to the mosque and offer prayers in congregation with other people. Um, it's about gathering with families and with other, with family and with other Muslims. Um, uh, yeah, um, however, uh, for many people, um, and then especially with those people, um, if you could press Hannah, um, with those people, um, I'm thinking of converts in particular, people who are far away from family and friends, and women, and particularly women with small children, um, if you could, um, yeah, women with small children. Ramadan can be very isolating, right? If you even just think of that sleep schedule, you're constantly sleeping um, at odd times, uh, you're up all night. And like, I have kids, I can't go to the mosque and just leave my kids at home, right? So, um, and my youngest still sleeps with me. So I'm praying by myself in a dark room while my daughter is sleeping um, in the bed. Um, and I have like a flashlight <laughs> to use to, to read my Quran. Um, and my um, my husband comes from a different religious background, so he you know we fast together and and we do we share elements of our worship together. But um, again, it's just it's different. My in laws aren't fasting. I'm fasting. Um, my family is in Texas, where I'm from, so I'm far away from family. Even growing up, um, my parents both have chronic illnesses, so I was fasting by myself from the age of nine. My brother had already moved out. Um, so I've been fasting by myself for most of my life. Um, and yeah, it, it is, it can be sad, it can be hard. Um, not again, not because it's hard to res refrain from food and drink, but because there's that image of like a family sitting around the table of breaking fast together. And um, only in rare times have I have I had that. But I've also noticed that now that my kids are getting older and they are choosing to fast more frequently throughout the month, it, that feeling is sort of coming together. So there's a way that you, you make your family and you make the environment, but that's not accessible to everyone. So um, yeah, that's that's a difficult part of Ramadan. Um, and then lastly, um, yes, fasting is hard. And I think actually this is what this is what gets me about that comment about, um, oh, I could never do that, is that it, it misses the point, which is that fasting is hard, but it's also the best thing in the entire world. Um, Ramadan is extremely challenging in, because that's the point. You're, you're forcing yourself to grow in every possible way, um, but it's amazing. Um, so um, we long for Ramadan, we pray to reach another Ramadan, uh, we're genuinely sad when it ends as much as we're excited to go back to drinking coffee. Um, many Muslims who can't fast feel intense sadness over not being able to fast. Um, it's, it's really hard to, to feel that Ramadan spirit without the fasting. Um, 
every pang of hunger, I like to think of it this way. Literally every time my stomach grumbles, I remember God. It's like God reminding me like, hey, I'm still here, right? And so um, it's it's just a beautiful, yeah, it's just a beautiful way of remembering God. Um, and then finally, um, just in a practical sense, when you're not making meals and cleaning up meals and preparing meals and eating meals, you have all this time in your day. <laughs> um, and replacing that with something like reading Quran or just prayer or, or charity, volunteering um, was something else I tried to do with my kids this year. Um, it's, it's just amazing how much time you actually have for those activities when you're, when you're standing for food. Um, and so there, it really is, um, it's lovely. This is just the best time of year. Um, and thank you for having me here today to be able to share it with you. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing. Um, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I hope everybody learned something. Uh, and I thought we'd finish uh, with the extinguishing of the candles with a, a reading from Saudi. Um, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. To worship God is nothing other than to serve the people. It does not need rosaries, prayer carpets, or robes. All peoples are members of the same body created from one essence. If fate brings suffering to one member, the others cannot stay at rest. This is a hymn in Arabic, um, and the translation is, let us live in peace, let us live in inner peace, let us weave our dreams together, let us die in peace. And um, it has, uh, the, the melody isn't sort of intuitive, 
but it, it's made with a great big space between each phrase. So we're going to sing it as a call and response. So um, if you know it, feel free to join us the first time. Otherwise, we're going to sing it again and you can join us then. I'm going to be the caller and the choir is going to um, model the, the response the first time. Oh, yes, and please stand in body or spirit as you are willing and able. Thy wound and I Each time I see 